being an entrepreneur. Right now is a golden time. It doesn't sound like it, but a great time for anyone who wants to hop in a business. And here's why. Welcome to Monday Mornings with Michelle, the new business podcast. Whether you're kicking off your day or kickstarting your business, Michelle is going to kick your ass into next week with the essential fours. Strategy, systems, support, and state of mind. Now, welcome to center stage, Michelle Nedelec. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I am here today with my most amazing guest, Steve. You are going to love him. Steve, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So we've had a chance to talk and it's been super fun, but give everybody the 5,000 foot view of who you are and what you love to do. Great. Well, I am biz coach Steve Fell. And what I do is I work with small business owners and entrepreneurs, helping them stop suffering from entrepreneurial depression and help them crack that elusive seven figure mark without burning themselves out. Yeah. We need more of that. Yes. So how did you get started in, in that realm in business? Well, I've owned and operated seven different businesses and ran three others. And since then I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of business owners. And I just found my passion kept coming back to working with small business owners and entrepreneurs because that's who needs that. I think they need the help the most. They might have a good idea for a product or service, but they just don't know business and the Failure rate for businesses in North America are, that's gross. And my passion is turning that around because this is someone's livelihood, their marriages, and we're here to help them save both. Nice. Love that. So talk to me about how you do what you do. What, what makes you different than other say, business coaches? Yeah, one of the things, I mean, I have multiple coaches underneath me, but I also have multiple programs to fit the needs of my clients. So I say it's my magic sauce where I can meet with a business owner for about 45 minutes and find them at least $10,000 to over $100,000 of hidden annualized revenue without them spending more money or marketing or advertising. And not only that, we can actually put in an implementation schedule to get it. What? So yeah, it's not just, oh, here it is and good luck. It's here it is. We have a plan of attack and now let's get it. I'll usually blow those out of the water. Nice. So you, normally I would wait until the end to ask you this. So how long might it take for somebody to be able to go from wherever they're at to where they want to be when they build your a plan out with you? And obviously somebody starting smaller, they probably don't have as big a goals in the end. And somebody that's already making seven figures going to eight is it's going to be a different plan. But on average, kind of say they want to increase by a hundred grand. Yeah, a hundred grand. I've seen it happen on smaller companies. They'll usually do it about six to eight months, but they needed to help. I have to have a team involved. And then I've had bigger companies. Uh, we've doubled them. Like, well, bigger would be like 750000 And they wanted to like hit that elusive million dollar mark. And I said, is that it? Don't we want to go a little higher? I go, we'll bust a million. And they thought I was joking. And seven months later, they were at 1.2. Nice. So curious in your mind, as you mentioned that, why doesn't anybody ever say I want to make 1.1 million? 1.1368. I don't know. <laughs> and it's funny. I've talked to so many consultants and I've done so much research on this. It, we call it the num- magic number of threes because at 300,000, businesses get stalled. So they hit that plateau. Then at 600,000, they hit another plateau. And 900, it was every 300,000. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't figure out because you hear a lot of businesses stalling out right around the eight to 900,000 and can't get over the million. Well, what got you here isn't going to get you where you want to go. You need to learn some new skills. You need to bring on the right peeps. You really got to work on your leadership style, and you better get your fingers out of the pie. And that's why I see one of the top problems with business owners not being able to crack that million is their micromanaging or being so involved in the day-to-day where they're the visionary and they shouldn't be in the day-to-day. Nice. Love that. So talk to me about, because when somebody goes into business, they have no clue about business for the most part, right? Something like 80% of entrepreneurs have no degree in business background or haven't read a business book. (laughs) Just going, hey, sounds like a good idea. And then when they get to that point where, uh, where they need to scale their business, and I use that 
probably way too much because I think people misunderstand what it means to scale your business versus growing your business. Scaling means you have a system that works and now you're going to put other people in place in order to operate and then you get to grow. So that is a whole different skill set than the previous one. But why don't people treat it the same way? Like, how come you can't use that same kind of tenacity to just go, hey, I got a great idea. I think I'm going to go into business as, hey, we got a great business that's working. Now we want to scale it. Well, I hate to say I was one of those people. So <laughs> I <laughs> then you should I, know firsthand why. <laughs> I, I know firsthand and it was not pretty. I'll give you that because I grew my business. And then one day I got hit with a great opportunity. 31 people wanted me to coach them one-on-one and I didn't have group coaching set up. I didn't have all these other programs set up and I knew I couldn't do that. And then that's when I reached out and got help going, I need to scale now. And it was a process, but I lost a ton of business because I was not prepared to scale but I brought the right people in to help me scale. And now I've, I have a scalable business and I, I love it. And that's one thing I think a lot of business owners don't realize is how to build a scalable business. But what is the end goal of your business? Because during the pandemic, we saw a lot of business owners had to shut their doors because they didn't have an end goal. They were just building a business. Hey, I want to make money and support my family. Well, they didn't build any systems and processes to sell the business or, you know, pass it on or do a buyout or merger. And the only option they had was close their doors. Oh, it sucks. Um, It hurts me. And I know that some people, though, when they go through that process, end up being better in the next run, if you will, because of all the things that they learn of what not to do and and that learning curve is painful, but sometimes it helps accelerate that on the other side. So there is hope, peeps. Uh, don't okay. lose hope just because you lost your business because we. I think we all go through it at some point. And if we haven't lost our business, we give up on our business. We throw it out. It's our you met, that's a great point. I mean, my very first business, it was grown like a weed. I was in, All my clients were in the tech sector. I'm not a techie. And well, the tech bubble burst. Well, so did my business. So I... Basically, I went and turned off the lights in my room, curled up in a corner, put a blanket over my head and cried, did what any good entrepreneur would do and cried. Mm-hmm. I, I, I felt like a giant failure. I lost all my clients in within 24 hours because of the tech bubble. And everything's gone. I had a laundry list of a line out the door, but it's all gone. And then three days later, I just put on my big boy pants and decided I'm going to start company number two. I'm going to start consulting the companies who are still around because now they're destroyed. And that was company number two. Nice. But first one in my eyes was a failure, but it was external circumstance. But you know what? I learned so much from that experience. It was I, I, yeah. Nobody can tell me that they failed just because a business didn't make six figures or seven figures or eight figures or because it closed the doors or because of anything. As soon as you have the notion that you're going to go into business for yourself, I see that as a huge success and a huge quantum leap for it because you have to think differently when you make that decision that you couldn't possibly go through any other way. So I think it's fantastic and awesome. Um, so congratulations, by the way. So talk to me about those business owners, let's let's focus on the ones that maybe they did have to shut their doors and they're looking at, okay, now what? Um, and I think a lot of people kind of either look at the coaching realm or they look at other things. There is a ton of opportunity right now, though, in the, in the digital realm of helping businesses or helping people um, just, you, there's a certain innovation that's happening in the world where there are so many weird problems that never existed before that they need new innovative solutions to them. So I think there's a ton of possibility there. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of things do you see that people need to kind of keep in mind as they're moving forward in this? You know, I teach this class called the ABCs of starting a business. And one thing we always bring up is about, you know, being an entrepreneur right now is a golden time. It doesn't sound like that a great time for anyone who wants to hop in a business. And here's why. Baby boomer, boomers are controlling most of the small businesses out there. So it could be anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to you know, 20, 50 million. 
They're at retirement age. What do you think they're going to do with their business? Their kids don't want it. That's less than 3% of all businesses that go to a legacy transfer. That means they're looking to sell their business. So why not look at something you're interested in, an established business with a track record that you can use and negotiate so you can actually, instead of having to come up with like say a million dollars to buy the business, you have a hundred thousand to buy the business and work out a finance deal to benefit both you and the past now owner. I think it's a phenomenal opportunity. Nice, that brings up an awesome point. And most people, all business owners, we get emotionally attached to our business. We would rather hand it over to somebody that's going to take care of our baby mm-hmm. and, and run it properly as opposed to, Hey, you're going to pay me enough for this. Nobody treats a business. So <laughs> if they no. do, it's like, Oh, okay, next. Yeah. And you know, real, I always have to tell them cause I've worked with a lot of buy sell folks. I help the, well, the seller build the business up to sell it. And then I help the buyer do transition. Cause I know the business now better than this person in I always tell both sides, it's like, you know what, give this new person six weeks and your business will not look the same. And they're like, why? And they go, they bought it to make it theirs. They need to put their stamp on it. So you're going to have to get over it. You got your money. Go back, go on the beach and enjoy the rest of your time. Nice. I love that. It reminds me of a friend of my parents who had a very successful company and just kind of outgrew it. It was time to sell it and hand it down to the next generation. And they said, well, um, he negotiated that he would stick around and train them and stuff. And then they negotiated that he could stick around and keep coming to work because he didn't want to leave. I was like, what am I going to do? Like, this is my family. I love you guys. And so he just went to work every day and I hung around and raised morality. And (laughs) that was his job. (laughs) I know a guy who sold the business to his kids, which is the smartest transfer way to do it. And they were in a great transition plan. Part of the deal was they had to hire the dad back on as their salesperson, no other function, because he was already their number one salesperson as the owner. So he still was the number one salesperson, but he didn't have to deal with all the other stuff. And he got a salary and a commission check. And it was the best, I'd say, buyout I've seen in such a long time. Sounds awesome. So let's go back to when somebody starts working with you and they get to go through and do an analysis of their company. What does that analysis look like usually? Yeah. First thing, like I said, we try to find them that hidden annualized revenue. Mm -hmm. And then we come up with the plan of attack because the number one problem I always hear from, you know, business owners is like, I want more revenue. Well, Maybe. If you really are a true smart business person, you want more profit. <laughs> That's the line you should be looking at. So great. We'll take care of the revenue side because prob- odds are you're not getting enough leads in and knowing how to convert them into revenue. Then when we get the revenue going, because that's going to ease a lot of pressure off you and obviously your home life as well. Now let's start working on the internal structure of your business to put the systems and processes in place to get the increase the profits. And then that way, we also have to develop an exit strategy, which no business owner ever wants to talk about when they start a business. But you need to know the end in mind so we can shoot towards that goal. It's like, you know, if you're traveling from one city to the other and that's your goal, but you have no plan to get there, you might get lost many times along the way. Or -hmm. if you think, hey, I'm gonna go from the east to the west. Well, where are you gonna go in the west? I don't know. That's where your business is. You're going to be all over the place. So you have to know that exit strategy. And then what I've always seen is once we start working on the internal structure, it's they get the right people on board. They get the right systems in place. And all of a sudden they're hmm, making more money and working a lot less and stop the grind. Right. I love that. It reminds me of one of my favorite things I ever heard Harvecker say was, you, you have to start with the end of mind and re- reverse engineer from that plan of you're going to sell this. And everybody's like, well, why? I just want to start my business, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He goes, because you're not going to sell, sell Dave's plumbing to Fred. <laughs> so right. like, you're not. So quit calling your business Dave's plumbing. And everybody in the crowd just kind of had this look up. Oh, I should probably think of that. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? But it was, it was super profound. It's like, 
the moment you start that idea of what you're going to do and what that looks like, whatever that thing is, and I don't care if you're painting things or if you're blowing shit up, it doesn't matter. You, you got to think about that as a business structure. So I may be a little cynical in my life, but, and I think I look at a business and I go, okay, a business is a business. Is there any time when a business isn't just a business, when it's not just, okay, it, there's a Lego, there's a foundation, this is exactly what you have to do. And you can paint it whatever color you want and they can do whatever they want in the rooms, but the foundation is the foundation. Is there any time that that's not true? Yeah, there's some times where people call it a business and it's actually a hobby. <laughs> or it's a hobby and you know it, it's like, Okay, you're working out of your garage. I get it. You can work out of your garage. But when you're working your butt off and not making any money at it and you have clients, there's a problem. That's not a business. So you need to be making some money because a business is you're exchanging money for a product or a service that someone wants or needs. You're satisfying a problem. That's business. And if you don't have that in place, and I see that all the time, we got to get that structure in there or they don't know their target market. They're trying to be everything to everyone. You know, every time I hear that in workshops, it just makes me, I try not to throw up honestly, because not everyone's your client. And I can just, I can prove that in like less than 30 seconds because you're, you're, that's why your business isn't flourishing. One of the reasons you don't know who your target market is and you're not clear on your message. So you're just floundering out there. And I think that's where a lot of small business owners, they start that business and go, hey, I'm going to sell, you know, resell products. Great. To whom? People. <laughs> that's Ooh, a good what? start. <laughs> <laughs> it's intriguing. And, that, and to me, that brings us to um, kind of what we were talking about before and tagging and wishing that you had tagged your clientele earlier. And I wish I had tagged my clientele. I <laughs> wish I had done a lot of things with my CRM that I haven't. But let's talk about, let's assume that people are already in business and they're, they're running it. They've got some semblance of clientele. What would be kind of, in order to know who your most profitable client is, who that sweet spot is, what kind of data does somebody need and how would they go about gathering that in your opinion? Yeah, a good CRM definitely helps, but I've been there, unfortunately, too. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I, <laughs> I know, it's like, how can I, you know, I've been down that road and I've sought help to definitely change my life around on it. But it's like, I was targeting one specific industry of people. And then all of a sudden, one day I had a full boat of clients. I can't take any more. And then I realized, I don't have one person in my target market, not one. So what I did is pulled all my current and past clients. Why did you work with me? And then I started pulling up their records. How much did they spend? How long to get the more data involved? And then they gave me way more feedback than I ever expected. And it was shocking. So I made some massive adjustments in my business and my target market, and then it took off even more. Nice. So pull your current customers and clients, pull their records. You can even keep it on. I, I even had a business who was doing a, half a million and they didn't have any CRM system. So it was like, just put it on Excel. So even if it's on Excel or if it's on your phone, I totally get that. Yeah, because I think it really is a mindset long before it becomes a technical issue. But the logistics of how you do it become irrelevant. The question yeah. is, how do you do it? And I think to your point, a lot of people will kind of hypothesize as to who their clients are. And it's like, okay, that's a good start. We'll, we'll market to them and we'll see what happens. But at some point when you get people coming through the door on a regular basis, you want to be able to go back and look at that data and go like, am I really selling the thing that I should be selling or what's going on? I think Walmart, because they have the, <laughs> the wallet to do it, right. They know exactly what's on the shelves, what's leaving the oh, yeah. shelves, what time of day it leaves the shelves, you know, why <laughs> Monday at three, they're selling more of these particular things than otherwise. And if we can kind of wrap our head around that idea on the bigger you know, on the Walmart level and then shrink it down and go, okay, now how does that pertain to me? Because it comes back to that profitability of the product and who's really buying your stuff. And if they're, if somebody says, well, we can't afford to charge more because people won't pay it. Well, has anybody paid it? Will anybody pay it? Are you just not marketing to those right people? Right. 
Like, there's oh, God. conversation thrown there. <laughs> there's, that's a big problem for small business owners. I'm afraid to raise my prices and all my clients will leave. Okay. I've done the math so many times with so many business owners. Believe me, I'm telling you right now, raise your prices. You're going to be fine. I love that. So when they do that, in my experience, it's usually the sales department that goes, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> okay, I get it. We've raised the prices. That was awesome. And <laughs> now what do we do? Because yeah. it is quite possible that, you know, whoever you've been, has been in your prospecting list or whatever, those aren't the right people anymore. So do yeah. we go back to say the marketing department? Do we go back to the sales guys and go, Hey, who have you been talking to? What is this work? So when, when somebody makes that decision, assuming that they have departments and even if, you know, I am the sales department and the marketing, <laughs> whatever, break it up into departments. Who has to think about what once somebody decides to raise their price? Yeah, it has to be methodical. I mean, mm -hmm. I just, some of my clients are CPA firms. So mm -hmm. They haven't raised their prices and one of them had in eight years. And I'm like, let's look at your margins now. And he, it was like, the first, here's a CPA. I am now making him look at his own margins. And he's like, I never look here. Well, why? It's like the plumber with the leaky faucet, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at that, we started analyzing his costs keep, and keep increasing, but his prices haven't. So his margin has been shrinking to nothing. He's wondering why he is broke and his agency is going crazy. Because you're well, focused on revenue. Focused <laughs> revenue on revenue. Revenue's doubled and we're making it up in volume. <laughs> That's it. Once we started looking at it, and then we also realized that 20% of his clientele were wasting 80% of him and his staff's time. So we knew by raising prices, we're going to weed some of those people out. And we're, all, and we're also going to attract a different client, clientele. So we updated his website. We did a whole bunch of changes. We sent out these nice letters to everyone explaining why the increase. He, out of all his clients, he had one complaint and that was one of the complainers anyway. So he told him where to go and he's so happy. They only lost, they were hoping to lose around a hundred clients of those bad clients. And they ended up only losing 10, all the rest paid the price. Wow. Nice. And they increased the price a little bit more for those people. You know, as retail has a PIA charge on a cash register which is a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's an extra surcharge. So they did that surcharge for these people who were sucking the life out of them in hopes that they would go away, but they didn't. And then we had to turn around and fire them. as <laughs> So not only did their bill go up every month for six months, then they end up getting fired. It's like, hmm. <laughs> because it was the best thing for the business. Now all his staff is, the morale is high. He's now making money that where he should be making money. And now he has a good guide, like, wait a minute, instead of showing like revenue or my profit declining every year, I'm going to show an increase. And now he's starting to show a business that he can sell on there. Because if revenue keeps, you know, Don't profit know keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, no one wants to buy your business. Right. <laughs> well, one of the things that I personally am focused on in my business is protecting my staff. And some people say that's wrong. You should protect the clients and the customer's always right. And you should satisfy your customers. I'm like, no, if my customers leave, I can go find another one. If my staff leaves, I'm screwed. <laughs> yeah. So I protect my staff. And it's like, if anybody's being rude or obnoxious, I am more than happy to come in and set things straight. I'll give a warning. And if within hours it hasn't changed, it's like, okay, this isn't working anymore. And hasta luego. Because that to me is... Well, it's also our legacy, right? So they're not only the ones doing the jobs that have to make people happy, but I'm hoping that they will be my exit strategy. <laughs> so it's like one yeah. day I'm going to sell to the staff because they're the ones that know the business and they know how to maintain it and carry it on. Or at minimum, if I have a happy staff and I sell it to somebody else and go, hey, the, st the staff's awesome. They all get along. They all interact. They're like, it is a self-contained unit that runs itself. Then it's a no brainer for somebody to come in and buy as well. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I'd say most of my clients, when we get down to the staff, it's like we weed out the, the bad ones, the morale goes up, and then we have to teach the owner how to hire the right person. And I've had well, seven businesses, believe me, I, my goal was always hire someone smarter than me. 
because I knew if I hired someone smarter with a different skill set, something they love, something I don't like, it's going to improve my business and they see it differently. And if I accept their input, which I did, my business was growing and everyone goes, all these people are smarter than you. I'm like, heck yeah, but who's the real smart one? You know, <laughs> me for hiring the smarter people. <laughs> exactly. Now, it brings me back to an old <laughs> expression of that the business owners are the C-grade students of the 80s. <laughs> They're now <laughs> running the tech corps and, and the A students are now working for them. It's so true. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So what are some of the stumbling blocks that somebody might be having at home right now? And they're thinking, oh, my God, Steve, I need you in my business so bad. Yeah, one of the big things is like you might be like grinding it every day. So if you're working Saturdays and Sundays late at night, like I hate to say it. I do my best thinking late at night. <laughs> so, Nothing wrong with working at 10 o'clock as long as you don't wake up at five and two over <laughs> Yeah, I just naturally do, but it, it's, it's really good. But that's where my I learned that's where my productivity zone is. So, but it's like if you have to, like you have to be in your business on weekends and nights, and you're just grinding, and it feels like you're a truck, your tires are in mud and just spinning, but you're not going anywhere. That's a great time to call. I mean, I have been there. And it was a, one of the hardest like ego decisions I ever made in my life. But 45 days later, my truck was no longer in the mud and my life was better. My home life was way better. My employees loved me a lot more. I wasn't so stressed about money and wor worrying about payroll all the time. It was a game changer. And if you get to that point where it's not fun walking into your own business, no matter what you do, that's the like my coach, one of my very first mentors, he goes, if it happens three days in a row, you have a problem. Nice. You better solve it. And if it happens seven days in a row, you better get out of it. Like quit, sell it, do whatever. But you're, it's going to hurt your customers. It's going to hurt everything, even though you don't think so. Once is accident, twice is mistake, three times it's a habit. <laughs> yeah, because it's just going to get worse and worse. And next thing you know, you're going to be, bankrupt, no family, no friends, because you've alienated them so much. It's just really bad. So I would say at that moment, get the help. I've been there. I swear it was, it was the game changer, the life changer, everything. And it was a hard lesson to learn. <laughs> and now I totally believe in it because I've brought in help many, many times since then. <laughs> I love that. So I know that our listeners are going to want more from you. How do they begin their journey with you? Hey, you can check me out on my website. It's bizcoachsteve.com. So that's B-I-Z, Coach Steve. And one thing I've offered for God, I don't know how long, at least two or three companies now, is being a business owner, sometimes we feel like a silo. We can't talk to anyone, right? We can't tell our employees how we feel because now they're going to update their resume and get the heck out of there. You can't tell your spouse or significant other at home because now they're thinking, oh, my God, how are we going to make rent? And why am I with this, you know, fill in the blank? They're applying you for extra credit cards just in case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It it's, causes that. So you have no and you've, you can't tell another business owner because now they're like, oh, they can't run their business. You're going to get that. I always offer get on a 15 minute call with me. No selling. You don't sell me. I don't sell you. And it's, you can vent about your business. You can ask a question. You could just talk, but you have someone to talk to that's not going to be judgy on you and do what they can to help. And I don't know how many business owners have taken that up on me. And just by venting, their life could change. All right. Finally get those stalls out. And that's when the ideas come is when you quit yeah. blocking yourself. I love that. So I have to ask you, Steve, at what point in life did you know that you're a special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? I was years ago, it was like uh, after college, I was brought on to start, help start a new company. So I was employee number five. A decade later, they had over 5,000 employees. Yeah. Wow. And I was in one division. So this other guy and I, we created the processes and everything. And then I was traveling with Musical X, proving the process. I started saving us so much money in logistics and operations and all these other things. 
And then all of a sudden the venues where I was at started going, wait a minute, we saw what you did here. Can you come and help us in our food and beverage, our ticketing, our operations in the venue? So I started doing double duty and I started helping them. And then I, I wanted to stop traveling and I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe I should open up a business, but I didn't know where to start, believe it or not. So I went and sought out help, how to start a business. And I finally found a niche and I fell in love. Right. So your process guy, this is awesome. Everybody yeah. you need, Steve, because here's the issue that happens in business. You're a visionary. You have a great idea. You go with gumption and you make it happen and you coerce somebody else to come and work for you. And the two of you grind it out. And neither one of you has a clue how to train anybody else on how to do what you just did awesomely. So that's where Steve comes in. So even if you're only a two-man team and you got that going on, it is not never too early to bring Steve into that. Yeah. And the fun thing is like, I love that stuff. I'm an operations marketing guy by trade, but I've three of the companies I went and I was a turnaround specialist, process improvement, change management. They were nice. dying a death and like help us change. And I said, well, I'm going to be a business interior remodeler. And they're like, what is that? And I go, I'm going to keep the shell looking the same. I'm going to strip everything down to its studs on the inside, rebuild it. Now, then I'll work on the outside. Once I rebuild the inside of the house. Nice. I love that. Awesome. So thank you so much for your time, Steve. I know how valuable it is. It's been awesome having you on. I can pick your brain all day. We all know that. <laughs> Any last words for our peeps? I say if, if you're ever struggling in your business or you get that wall or feel that grind, you know, please, if it's not me, someone else, reach out, get the help. That's one of the hardest things for small business owners and entrepreneurs to do is ask for help. And I swear to God, it will help actually help and change your life. So ask for help. Awesome. This is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being with us here today. Be sure to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast apps so that we can help you scale your business. We love having you here. Thank you for listening to our show. I'm all about being a resource center for entrepreneurs to give them the information and the support that they need to make it in business. As such, the notes for this show can be found at our website at awarenessstrategies.com slash blog. Be sure to subscribe, give us a rating, I like five stars personally, and share with your friends.